Right. Welcome everyone to Fazlift's podcast episode nine. Um, really been looking forward to this one. I uh, got a friend of mine, Mark, who I've known for a good few years, and uh, he's a powerlifting coach. Uh, as you all know, that was my first love in the gym, so I was really excited about this one. Um, so I'm going to do Mark a quick introduction. Uh, it's Mark Keys. He's a lifetime natural. He started lifting roughly about the same time. Matty I as fuck. Matty as fuck. <laughs> he started lifting <laughs> as, about the same time. As you I can did. tell. <laughs> started lifting about the same time I did in 2000, 2001. Um, he, he gained a bit of notoriety in 2012 for this huge mega cut to 93 kilo class, which I believe he did one meal a day. Is that right? I seem to remember. Yeah, pretty much. That was the big one meal That's a day. That's intermittent right? fasting, yeah. That's it, yeah. Uh, in his own words, he set a bunch of powerlifting records and won a bunch of powerlifting competitions. He's immensely strong. And for my bodybuilding fans, get this, he's benched 180 kilos. That's four plates aside for 10 reps, uh, which is pretty fucking immense. Uh, he's head coach at Edinburgh Barbell, and uh, he's here to answer our questions about all things powerlifting. So welcome, Mark. Well, thanks for the intro. Yeah. Thanks for having me on as well. Awesome. Yeah, I've been, I've been looking forward to it. Um, right, so we'll get straight into the questions. We've got quite a few, so uh, we'll kind of see, uh, we'll see you know, how, uh, how far we get into these. Uh, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to kick off with the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the Ronnie Prayer. Won't be which... that name. <laughs> this is the Ronnie Prayer that, uh, that Mark wrote. So just to kick it off for us, if you join, join me in prayer here. Our Father who art in Olympia, Ronnie be thy name, thy gains come, thy squats be done. In pure gym, as it is in Metroflex, give us this day our daily swole and forgive us our weakness as we forgive those who spot reps against us and lead us not into Gymshark, but deliver us from CrossFit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise be thy name. <laughs> Praise be to Ronnie. Love it. <laughs> right. So, uh, first question. Then. Now, over the years, you and I, we've both moved away from a more specific approach to powerlifting as in much more frequency of the main lifts to include more variety. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that and what, what sort of caused that transition? Well, uh, there are so many, that, so when you're training for any sport, you're training for any physical quality, there's only so many variables that you can juggle. So we have frequency, we have intensity, we have volume and we have variation we have overload and we have regression. So these are all, so periodization or programming is the interplay of all these factors put together into a diet or a schedule over a finite time span. So that could be 20 years, it could be three months, depending on the time span. So when we, when we, when I, so I've been training um, specifically for strength um, since about 2001, 2002, as you, as you mentioned, so this is now year 17, 18 in my lifting career. So, so just, just as it goes, certain things start working. So when I started off, I started off with a pretty typical approach where I would have, you know, I'd have a leg day, chest day, deadlift day. And then I'd, I always find, for me personally, I've always really liked the kind of push-pull upper body, lower body split. So upper day, lower day, day off, upper day, lower day. So that's something that I kind of came across in my second year of powerlifting. But for my first probably 10 years as a lifter, I probably trained squat once a week, bench twice a week, deadlift once a week. And I was either trying to put more reps into the workout, so I'd maybe do a single set, try add reps to it, or try add weight to set a rep scheme. I was always trying to overload one workout. And then eventually I came across the idea of, well, the first thing that I came across was John Brews and the Squat Every Day program which then I did, so squat the max six days a week. So in those three weeks, I went from, I think, a 205 kilo squat to 222 kilo squat in three weeks. Wow. And I also uh, had it, I also caused damage to my MCL, so I couldn't squat properly for six months after those three weeks. But basically, I went, I kind of went from like the lowest amount of frequency to the highest amount of frequency, and then I got hurt in the process. And then through through rehabbing and getting getting back to training, I kind of settled upon about twice a week or three times a week per squat, something that something that I find worked. And for a period, just squatting and maybe doing pause squats worked really well. And then eventually, as anything, when we do something for too long, 
eventually it stops working so well. So I've kind of found kind of where I'm at now is I still, most of my volume is still spent on the lift I'm trying to get better at or a variation or a very close variation to the lift I'm trying to get better at. But I do find that I track better when I, when I have, when I have a change of focus somewhere in the workout or have a change of, um, or have, I have a change of, change of implement or just, just to keep the motor pattern pretty similar. But dude, I, I just find changing things in the program, whether it's like 30 or 40% of, of the volume, changing the focus on that just helps to tick along and it helps to help to prevent stagnation. So if you're putting all your chips in one, if you're putting all, putting all your eggs in one basket, as in just doing squat, for instance, to get better at squat four days a week, five days a week, it's going to work well and it's going to really, it's going to work really well for, for a finite period of time, but eventually it's going to stop working. Mm-hmm. So the, the trick to the trick to periodization or the trick to programming is to have something work well for a long time. So if we can have it work a bit less well, where we don't get, we, we, we don't get, we don't adapt as fast, but we adapt for a longer process. And that's a, that's a superior method than a short, sharp, acute way of programming or a way of overloading for instance like small log we can we can we can we can have an over specialization we can have an over specialization and we can have a massive overreach and we can potentially put on 50 kilos on our lift in a 12-week span but then where do we go after this mm. and the chance uh, and is, 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 the, is the risk worth it so if you're uh if you've been training for two years and you've uh, you have a 1.5 times body weight squat it might be worth it if you're training for 12 years and you have a three times body weight squat, probably not worth it because you're probably going to get hurt. Did that answer the question or is it probably yeah. a bit rambling? Yeah, that, no, that's good. That, that's a really good answer. That makes a lot of sense. And just to sort of analogize it for, for my listeners, there's a similar thing that I do with bodybuilding. And we tend to use rotations. So whatever the split might be, it might be up or low or it might push my legs. As the lifter gets more and more accustomed and stronger in that particular rotation, we'll add rotations. Um, so there'll be a push pull legs rotation, they'll add a second push pull legs and a third push pull legs. And that way they're still going at maximum intensity on the first one, but there's that added inbuilt level of variety there. And the stronger they get and the more proficient they get, that we'll just add more and more variety. And that seems to keep things ticking along quite nicely rather than just slamming the same thing over and over again. Well, you get them. Um... Everyone has an adaptation curve. So when I introduce someone to uh, introduce a stimulus to somebody, they will have a certain amount of uh, exposures to that stimulus where they will they'll get a positive adaptation or they will adapt and, and they'll get better. They'll be able to put more weight on the bar or, or the weight will get easier or, or whatever the metric is. But eventually when we keep using the same stimulus over and over again, we, we get a dose response. We're going to blunt it. So, one of the ways that, so if you look at a good way, a good framework of looking at this is Mike Tushner's emergent strategies, where we just look at a micro, micro, stru, micro cycle structure. So we put a week of training together and we just, we just expose you to that same week of training over and over again. And we see what your adaptation is like. So you might find that lifter A might progress for two workouts and then regress on week three. And then maybe they make it a good week, week four, and then regress week five, regress week six. That person we know with enough exposures to a new stimulus, we know we're going to get two good weeks, bad week, good week, and then we need to pull back because we're then we're, we're, we're st- stagnating. Whereas someone else might have 12 workouts in a row where they get better, get better, get better, and then eventually they, they, they stop adapting and they start, they start plateauing, they start regressing. So that's probably the best framework I've seen for that kind of to, to kind of to, to tweeze out the adaptation or to tweeze out the individualization of the adaptation. Every, one thing we hear a lot, and I've heard a fucking shitload, is individualization. But the actual frameworks to produce individualization to someone doesn't really exist. The, the only the only real attempt that I've seen that actually I think looks pretty useful. Is probably the emergent strategies. Even something like um, juggernaut training systems, where they have uh, like the, the minimal effective volume, the maximum recoverable volume. Those are generalities, and then we're just making generalities based off. We're assuming because you're female, you can handle more. We're assuming because you're older, you can handle less. We're assuming because you're stronger, you can handle less. And these are generalities, and 
uh, uh, being a generality, they will apply to most people most of the time. However, it's not individualization. It's just generalities apply to an individual. Yeah, I mean, that's the emergence. Oh, sorry, Karen. I was saying the emergent strategies is actually t not making assumptions. It's providing the stimulus, laying out the stimulus, and then applying the stimulus to an individual, and then observing what happens mm. to the individual. So that to me is the only true, the only, not the only true, but the only like useful framework I've seen someone trying to apply the word individualization to actual programming. That is, that is really interesting. Um, just kind of briefly on that note, that was, I've never actually heard of emerging strategies before from uh, Tashir, but that was the very first, it sounds similar to the very first, my first introduction to periodization from a guy called Dan Jong. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, yeah, I don't know I, him, but I know of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually wrote to him back in the day. This is when, you know, you could write to these internet guys and they sort of message you back straight away. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I was stuck on something like a 160 squat. And he, he asked me to look back at my training diary and see when things start to fuck up. And I, I found it was generally the third week for me. So I adopted a two weeks on, one week deload paradigm, which was really unusual at the time. No one was really doing that, but that took me pretty much from a 160 squat right up to 227 um, within a space of like six months. And that was my first exposure to actual formal periodization. But it sounds like a very similar thing to what you're describing. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of like, it's, it, it, it's all, but periodization is quite messy. What we assume with periodization is quite messy because we have, so we look at something like it's pretty simple template to understand. It's like a, it's a daily undulating periodization, it's a stupid fucking name. <laughs> but we have work. We will work out one where we have a. I I personally despise the use of things like strength workout, hypertrophy workout. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's not reality is in boxes, but periodization is very bad for putting things in boxes. But we'll use we'll use the terminology because everyone understands it. So we have a strength day where we do six sets of three at eighty five percent. And then we have a speed day where maybe we might do eight sets of four at 70%. And then we have a hypertrophy day where we do three, five, three sets of 10 at 70%, say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Every workout is squat, five, deadlift. And then what we do is we just add weights to the bar indefinitely until we start, start stalling. So that, that, for instance, that's a daily undulating periodization model. But it's just three separate workouts yeah. where we have – a stimulus, a stimulus, a stimulus, and we're just adding weight. That's not really periodization. That's just, that's just, but that's what people understand as, as periodization. Periodization is to take a look at a problem and we say, so we have a lifter who wants to squat, wants to like put, oh, we have a lifter who wants to be a better power lifter. So we have a blank canvas, we have a comp of 12 weeks. So the actual, the actual, the actual process of putting together that plan in that time frame, bearing in mind where they're at and what they need to work on, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's periodization. And it, but then the framework around that, for it to be, um, for it to be individual, needs, need, we need, if I only met you and we only started working together, I can't individualize a program. It, only maybe in year two can I really individualize your approach. It takes time. It takes experience. Um, and it's not necessarily it's not it's not necessarily true. So if we look at something, so if we look at a, a pretty common loading cycle like the Russian squat routine, uh, if you don't if you don't know what it is, you can look it up. It's it's it's, it's well documented. It's it's a six week program, three week three week of uh, overreach of volume, three week of peaking. So I've put a few lifters on that recently. Um, so, for instance, I put one of my guys, who's one of my stronger guys, who's a 220 plus bench, put him on for bench press, stalled out, regressed, put it on, put one of my stronger girls on it, who went from like a 160 squat to like a 172 for two squat. Uh, so, there's it, two people who are strong in their own right, but put on the same stimulus, one regressed, one made massive jump of progress. So, it, it, it's observations like that that actually. That's kind of where I think the, the emergent strategies kind of as a differentiating factor. It, it don't, it don't think itself is anything special, but it's a framework of thinking that I think is special and something that people would, would people want to like progress and, and speed up their progression and actually actually be able to like say, oh, that works for me, that doesn't work for me. It's kind of like a framework that I think is really important to. Yeah, I think that. that 
I think that's a great point. Uh, I think it's well worth sort of repeating and emphasizing that people come to coaches looking for the key to individualization, uh, as in it, it should be like a very flat pack box. Um, to know, this is what the coach will do for me, will individualize. But the reality is that we work with people uh, and through working with them over time, can we really get to know what they're like and we can provide that level of personalization and individualization. You can't do it off the bat necessarily. And that's not a fault of the coach. That's just the fact that the coach actually knows what he's looking for, right? Yeah, so it would be, it would be better to come to a coach who has the frank conversation says, look, I always say with people if they ask, and what we, we always start with an arbitrary cycle, and then from there, I'm looking at your, I'm looking at how you're reacting. So we normally start off with two squat days, two deadlift days, four bench days, and then we apply a pretty standard um, loading cycle, and then we just let you go with it. So, and then from then, I see how you're reacting to it, and then the better the person is at communicating, the quicker we can get towards getting something that works towards you. Yeah. So you, you might find so, so have some people who do two, two work sets of deadlift a week and then they do the rest as RDL and some people who do like 20 plus work sets of deadlift a week. It just depends because we, we all start at the kind of similar starting point and then from there, from that starting point through communication, through trial and error, then we can come, across, we can come to something that works for you as an individual. Whereas if we just if I just have a system, the the marquee strength system, and I just apply that one system to everybody, we get mixed results. Some people works well, some people it doesn't, some people it kind of works for. But we're not actually coaching. We're not actually individualizing. I'm just I have, I have one hammer, and if if your nail doesn't fit my hammer, then it's not going to work. And yeah. That's not coaching. That's a that's a great point. I think in in a similar way to. I find frustrating is if clients come to me wanting to um, just at the beginning of a prep and that's all they hire me for is a prep. Like I, I don't really know their bodies. I've not worked with them before. Whereas if we have a preceding um, off season and then we go into a prep, uh, it gives me that much more time to actually understand a bit more about how they react to certain things. So it, the prep becomes easier. I guess it's similar to what you're saying. Yeah, it's exactly kind of what I'm saying. People, people assume I'm going to, I'm going to take this seriously for 12 weeks. I'm going to throw everything into it. I'm going to do really well. Whereas if you want to actually engage in the process, it's the first kind of, the first year is almost a wash mm. because you're trying to kind of, not that it's not, not that it's a wash, but the results aren't going to be the same as year two, year three, year four, assuming that we're engaging in the process of coaching. Because as we get, as we get to know each other better and, and as our feedback loops become tighter and tighter entwined, we become much more effective in what we're doing. Yeah. So like people, people, people tend to think of it as like a short. People, people are very results based. They want, they want to see the results and they want to see the results fast. Yeah. Whereas if they were, act, if they actually wanted to see results, they would look at it as a multi-year endeavor, as opposed to like a short sprint. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I think I only really got probably noticeably strong in probably year five, I think, that I was lifting. Um, so, yeah, it, it takes a while, even if you're sort of, you know, really into, uh, you're really concerned with, like, evaluating your workouts and things like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's great. Uh, I, I love it. I'm going to move on to the next. Hello? Oh, sorry. Yeah, cut out. My bad. I'm back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, hit, uh, <laughs> I hit a button. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Right. So go on to, going on to the next question. Um, what are your thoughts on how often people should compete um, in powerlifting per year? If you're a beginner, three to four. If you're advanced, two to three. Okay. So fairly often for beginners. Yeah. So, so, I, always, so I try and like, so if someone's first competition, I always try and say to them, although it doesn't ring true with them, but I, I literally don't give a fuck how you do you're going for the experience. Mm. So I deliberately undercook beginners. So I always like, I would always send someone in with an opener that I'm sure that even if they're like on heroin withdrawal, they'll still make it. <laughs> right. I, I'm a hundred percent confident that they can make it. Cause people, be, people fuck up. Mm. I try and, I try and like be as clear and give as clear instruction as possible and prepare as well as possible. But someone somewhere, is going to jump a command. If you jump a command, you're going to miss the lift. Yeah. 
So if you drop a command on the first squat of the first meet, that could be that's, that could potentially be an absolute fuck up if we don't if we've opened slightly too heavy and we drop a command or we miss on depth and it becomes more difficult. There's more pressure. Yeah, we've all we've all seen that people with comp yeah. doing that. Yeah, and, yeah. and then if, and then the third one is it's an all or nothing lift, and all of a sudden your opener is now the most stressful thing you'll probably experience in powerlifting ever. Yeah, on your first day of your first competition of your first lift, and then if you <laughs> miss that, you have a shit day. Yeah, whereas I, I, I try and take as much pressure off as possible and tell people, look, it's just experience. And then once you've done that, once you've had that experience, you went through it, hopefully you went nine for nine, every lift was easy, you maybe set a EPB here and there, but we have a number of nine. Mm-hmm. And then set, next time we beat it, and yeah, then we I- beat it again, and then we beat it again. And we just get in that kind of virtuous cycle of doing well. And every time we do well, there's more left in the tank. And then we build momentum, and that creates a good lifter. Someone, someone who now is more motivated because they're doing well, has targets to beat, has a minimum target to beat. Minimum targets the last comp. Anything above and with is great. But it just, it just creates a virtuous circle of training, a virtual, virtuous cycle of training. Whereas we go into a competition and really think it's like the most important thing we'll ever do. Like a question I get a lot is, when should I do my first competition? Straight away, as soon as you can, is the answer to that question. Because all you're doing is you're putting that you're putting that pussy on a pedestal. When <laughs> what we want to do is you just want to go out and fuck. And then once we've done that a few times, then it becomes less of a big deal. And then we can actually work on the process itself rather than worrying about the competition is this big thing. Whereas it almost kind of changes when you become more advanced. Because the, the process of preparation for, preparation for competition and execution of competition is not training. So, so if you look at kind of like a, like a team sport athlete, like a rugby player or a football player, the preseason is of immense importance for that person because it's the only time they get to develop physically. When we get in the process of week in, week out competition, we can't develop physically because our, our turnarounds, our competitions are too close together. Whereas if we look at, there's a reason why physical sports like running, jumping, lifting, throwing, they have, they have an annualized calendar and the competitions are like maximum a month apart. Because to engage in a physical sport, we need to, we need to engage in physical training. And if we're doing competitions too often, we reduce the window of physical training. So if we give a beginner three or four competitions in a year, that gives us a chance to have 12-week cycles, three, three 12-week cycles, and then it gives us maybe a 20-week off-season or a 20-week period where we can like focus down on working on weaknesses, working on other things. Whereas for a more advanced lifter, we're more developed physically, so it takes us longer time to actually produce physical peaks in performance. We can't, I can't, it, it, for, me to, it, for me to produce a, a personal best, it's, it takes 20 weeks. It takes 25 weeks. It doesn't. I can't turn around four weeks. I, I need to spend minimum four to six weeks for do, doing the preparation work, the higher rep stuff, the general prep to give me the launching pad from where I can then move into like more specific work and try and push towards new personal bests, new new heights. Whereas a beginner doesn't need that prep work because. A lot of their, a lot of the, so the difference in the adaptation for someone who's advanced, a lot more of their adaptation is more morphological, meaning they need to put on muscle mass, they need to make physical change before then they can then move into the point of taking advantage of that physical change, like producing neurological changes, basically getting stronger at the movement, so getting stronger at squat, getting stronger at bench, getting stronger at deadlift, becoming more efficient at it, but without the morphological change, they can't realize a new a new height because they should already be efficient in what they're doing. Whereas a novice who is not efficient in what they're doing, they're constantly on an upward trend because that morphological change is happening, that neurological change is happening, and it's happening at a much, much faster rate. So the, the, the physical need for development is different for both um, athletes. Yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, I think, and I, I completely agree. I think your, you, your ranked beginner can improve so fast that they can 
compete three, four times a year. Uh, they'll be. I, I'm, a, I'm glad you agree with the theology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they'll 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 probably be setting PRs more than likely throughout the year. At least they should be certainly if they're a ranked beginner. Yeah. But for the advanced lifter, yeah, it just it just takes that much longer, and it's something that the listeners should be aware of because this certainly happens in bodybuilding as well. I made a post on it recently. Competing far too often just doesn't leave you with enough room, and this is powerlifting or bodybuilding, to actually improve if you're at a reason, if you're at a reasonable level. Um, I imagine it's probably even worse than bodybuilding because the, yeah. the period of preparation of bodybuilding is actually catabolic. Yeah, people people love it as well. People love to talk about like the 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 season, you know, because they, they think they're walking around like an IFBB pro. But the, the the reality is, most people don't need to be competing every year. They need to compete when they've made sufficient improvements to actually show something off. Uh, and as you say, in the same with powerlifting, for the advanced lifts, that can take a while. Um, so that I'd much rather see people do that. I've seen people waste six months, you know, four months prep, two months recovery, uh, and as you say, you don't really get better during that time. No, you very much just showing off what you got. Yeah. That's that part of it is the same. When we're picking for a meet, we're just showing off what we got. Yeah. It's only it's the periods where we're not trying to show what we got. That's the periods when we're making progress. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. This is a great point. And yeah, build, building is definitely very very different to testing. Um, all right. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. So moving into the next question. Speaking in broad strokes, how does the training of advanced lifters differ? I know this is going to be an odd question, specifically after we've talked so much about individualization. But just in broad strokes, have you noticed any sort of similarities between advanced lifters, your advanced guys? Uh, no. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, the, the, the difference is the individualization. So when someone becomes advanced, the difference is they have kind of their own path, they have their own way of training. Um, when someone's novice, they're just they're a, they're a blank canvas. So we just we need to train. We need to have some kind of structure. So we have just apply our structure, and then with time, like we kind of discussed this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Whereas I'm fucking awful at deadlift. So the way I train deadlift is different from how Tom during Tom Martin trains deadlift. Yeah, yeah. He has great leverage for it and can handle like a, a high frequency of higher intensity training. So he trains like that and he gets better at that. Whereas if I was to do Tom's program, I would regress week on week. Yeah. Whereas he progresses week on week. I, I had a similar experience to you. I, I, was, I was at my strongest training under Tom. And I was squat benching deadlifting heavy four days a week uh, and light twice. But while I got strong, that, that led to most of my basically career in the injuries. <laughs> so um, worth it, kind of, maybe, I guess. Uh, there you go. Um, just, just kind of on that note, while we're talking about sort of form and recovery and stuff, you've, you've said in the past that you don't necessarily mind what person's form looks like as long as it's within the rules. I think I'm kind of paraphrasing there. Um, could you kind of expand on that? Like, there, there seems to be, a, there seems to be. I mean, if you're looking at the IPF, there seems to be a way that most people squat, a way that most people bench. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, when we look at um, technique or when we look at execution, we, we need to strive towards what is perfect model. So, we need to have, we need to have technical model in our head. So, our technical model for a for a sumo deadlift or for a squat is going to be, or for a deadlift, sorry, around sumo deadlift. Our technical model for a squat versus a deadlift is going to change on the archetype of the person. So if we have someone who is an archetypical squatter's build where they have a long femur and short torso, probably depending on how that's put together, that might be put together in a wide stance or it might be put together in a close stance depending on, again, how they're put together. How that person, how we're going to strive towards that person's squatting is probably going to look more like a weightlifter. So they're probably going to have the bar will be higher on the back. They're probably going to have a closer stance, and they're probably going to bury it. Mm. Whereas, because they're going, to, they want to rely on quadriceps. They want to want to remain upright. They want to stay out of how someone who is more of a, a deadlifter's build, who has more of an equal distribution of um, femur and torso, who can have their hips close to the bar while having a really high hip position get in a good back position for deadlift. So that person's going to typically have like more of a lower bar squat. And they're going to have more of a backy squat. But someone with a backy squat is going to want to actually use their hips, use their, their lower back, use their upper back. So they're going to have a lower position. They might have a moderate stance. Um, and, and they're not going to bury it. They're going to hit depth. It's, gonna be, it's probably going to be difficult for them to hit depth the way they're squatting. 
yeah, they're going to rely more on the muscles of the back, the the glutes. So they're going to they're going to sit back more, whereas someone with like more of a scorer's build is going to sit in more. They're going to have more knee travel, whereas the person with the lower bar is going to have less knee travel. So it's more it's more kind of it's having like developed models of of for a body shape, what kind of movement is more efficient, yeah. and then it's taking that kind of archetype and then looking at the person that you, that, that you're coaching. And then seeing was they more of this, they more of that kind of body shape, they more of this kind of body shape, and then from there it's making adjustments. So when I see someone, so I, you're squatting, and I see a movement where we go right, why your stands out? Okay, does that look better? Does that look worse? That looks shit. Bring it back in. Does that look better? That look worse. That looks pretty good. Put the bar up higher on your back. Put a lower on your back. Just things like that. It's it's more about finding like the rough edges of what we want, and then once we have the rough edges of what we want then it's like chipping away at the rough edges and trying to make it more efficient. So one thing we want in a squat, we want the bar over the midfoot and we want the bar to travel straight up and down in a vertical plane. Everyone wants to do that. Mm-hmm. How I do that, how you do that, how someone else does that is different. So it's, it's about producing, producing the efficiency of movement that we want but applying it to the individual so that it makes sense within their structure. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. The The common one that I see quite a lot, the bench and deadlift seem to be f- perform reasonably well, but the common one is as soon as I see someone in the gym take a take the squat out of the rack and adopt a really wide stance, I just put down everything I, I'm doing and just watch because I know it's going to be an absolute shit show. Um, you know, you, you can just tell. Um, what what do you do in those circumstances when you're, coming, when you're coming with someone who does have perhaps longer limbs and a more backy squat and they just can't get depth for the life of them, what, what are some fixes there? So we need to teach them how to produce depth first and foremost. So wall squats, front squats, goblet squats, counterweighted goblet squats, things where we're, we're changing the orientation of the bar. Overhead squat's a good one. We change the orientation of the barbell. So we put it overhead, we put it out in front, we put it on your shoulders, we change the barbell, maybe a safety bar squat. And then we, we just fuck around with stances. We fuck around with like how you're doing it. The first, the first thing we're trying to do is produce depth. So we're not like necessarily with a beginner. We're trying to produce stability and control before depth. Whereas if we have someone who is more of a practice behind them, and they have a defined problem where they just cannot hit depth, we want to produce the depth. So once we produce depth using high bar squat, safety squat bar, front squat, goblet squat, whatever it is, then once we have the depth, then it's once we have the depth, how do we produce control to that? And then that it's that's a different question. It's how do we brace? How do we set up? Yeah. Um, how how do we break into the squat when we break into the squat as we go down and the the length relationships change between hip and knee, lower back. How does the control change as we go down? It's not as simple as just sitting down and producing a perfect squat. As I sit down into a squat, my knee changes. My where my knees are changes. Where my hip changes. The 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 strength the, the the length strength relationship of the glutes of the lower back of the psoas they all change so it's how I then change my my movement so that I can maintain that neutral lower back rather than because how I produce a neutral lower back standing is not the same as how I produce a neutral lower back when I'm sitting on the grass mm-hmm. so it's just about learning that and then how do, to to create that learning environment it's not so much about talking to someone we need to you need to produce an understanding but once someone has an understanding it's then producing environments where they can they can hold it and replicate it so like box like changing the height of a box box doing a front squat doing an overhead squat changing the kind of the orientation changing the execution of the skill then can produce the outcome that we want so we can produce the outcome we want in a front squat say someone who can now someone who can squat to death with a good back position now, now we can take that. Once we have that, we, we felt that, we understand that, we have that orientation, we have that understanding, we have that proprioception, then we put the bar on the back and then we produce it there. And then once we produce it there, maybe in a high bar squat, maybe we move to a lower bar squat and then we try and produce it to competition depth. So it's just, it's about it's having clear understanding of what, the goal is, and then once we have a clear understanding of what the goal is, it's then producing, starting to engage in a process, starting to engage in a problem-solving process that then ends with the outcome further down the line, whether it's within 20 minutes or 20 weeks. 
yeah i think i think also for the client to just sort of accept that that's probably not going to feel that comfortable for a good long while until it becomes natural to the body um i worked i worked with a crossfit client recently on getting her squat depth down to where it needs to be and uh, she was doing that and it was kind of uncomfortable then she got talked by another coach who convinced her of the uh, the benefits of grounding the feet and not wearing shoes uh, and she came back to me thinking this was actually magical. When I saw the video, she said, this feels so much better. When I saw the video footage, again, she was going nowhere near depth. Um, so she hadn't actually fixed anything. She just basically result, reverted back to her shallow squats again that, because they felt better. Um, yeah. Which I think was, it was just a, a ridiculous thing. Well, it's like, so there's a few things you can unpack there. So for the client, they need, they, they, so that person is like looking for, obviously looking for the short, sharp fix. Mm. So there's a, there's a problem in their mentality there where they're they're looking elsewhere. So I work I work with a lot of people. So the people who succeed are the people who just engage and go along with it. Now some people can make do it faster than I do. Some people might do it slower than I do. Some people are better coaches. Some people are worse coaches than me. So depending on who you're working with, like you're gonna get a faster result or like a slower result depending on variables. But the people indefinitely who stick with a process get an outcome. The people who engage with the process but then start keep looking at shiny things, they end up spinning their tail indefinitely. Yeah. So that person has a fault in their thinking in, in, in that sense. Yeah. And then and then from another sense is so why does that feel better? What what about being grounded feels better? What do you understand as feeling better? So it, it's kinda like, like everything is like Every little snippet has its own little kind of backstory as to how she's got there, how you've got there. And then like, I think being a coach is just like understanding that and then maybe trying to like change ways of thinking, change mindset. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not just simple as having like, I know how to get people strong. I would do this. Blah, 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 blah. It's, it's here's here, here are tools. Here are you, here are me, here's me. How do we interact and produce an outcome? And how, 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 with time, how do we get better at producing outcomes? Yeah, so, since since I know you're of the same opinion, uh, this this seems to be a fairly common thing in CrossFit, and certainly the ones that I've seen. Um, I've I, a friend of mine showed me the, some deadlift videos of her box owner deadlifting, and he was yeah. sort of doing it on a light day, and he was making a complete fucking hash of it. Um, the ball was moving faster, not necessarily because he's doing anything better but because he was just lifting a lighter weight. And every single rep, he would bounce the bar basically off his shin. So he was pulling with the bar far too close to his body. And that's yeah. effectively what's pushing him out of position when he was in the heavy work, but he just didn't realize what was happening during the light work. Yeah. Um, it seems to be a lot of, ooh, shiny object kind of thing with CrossFit, as opposed to just looking at, you know, what, what are we doing and let's stick to it for a while and try and perfect this rather than throwing something else at it. One week it's well, new shoes, one week it's like a baited vest, whatever. If you think about it, and from its nature, though, it's, it, it produces that. It produces that mindset. It produces that. So if I'm a if I'm a new person in the exercise, and I become a powerlifter or a weightlifter, or I do BJJ or I do Mai Tai, I do a discipline where there is there 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 is a path from being a novice to being an expert, and that path is well trodden. It's defined. It requires discipline. It requires consistency. It requires a lot of what are, if you want to master something, it, it requires all the things that you need to master a task. Mm -hmm. Whereas I look at something like cross, what's one of the worst things that we, people talk about when it comes to bodybuilding or strength training? Program hopping. Mm -hmm. What is CrossFit by nature? It's daily program hopping. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so by its own nature, the way that, it's set out. It's setting people out to have that kind of chill chasing. That that chill says the 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 CrossFit all is almost by definition ch tail chasing. Mm. When it when it gets taken to a different when it gets taken to a different level. So when we talk about the performance athletes in CrossFit, your Rich Fronins or whoever the guy, the big guys are now, I don't really know. No. I don't really follow it. But how do they train? Yeah, they don't train in a box. They train, they train like athletes. Yeah, exactly. They do aerobic training. They do strength training. Yeah. They do skill training. And then they, they try and raise all their separate disciplines to – so they try and – so they have, the, they have general they – have, they have GPP markers in CrossFit. Your aerobic skill, 
your weightlifting skill, your your aerobic capacity. So those are th our three kind of core disciplines, if you will. The better we can raise these general physical markers before we enter a competitive season where we're doing random workouts put together that challenge all these different aspects, that's when our more, more specific thing, like our, our ability to handle lactate, our ability to do 25 thrusters, jump into 25 pull-ups, and then just like engage in that. Someone who's coming with a better base and then goes into a specialization phase will be a much better crossfitter than someone that constantly trying to do that specialization phase. Yeah. So it's almost ass backwards. It's, it's like if someone wanted to come to become a powerlifter and then we just said, we're going to do, we're just going to do a powerlifter competition every day. That's how you're going to get better. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's, it's more or less what it is though. It's, that's, that's, that's exactly, you know, I've, I've banged this drum so many times. Is that just repeatedly over and over again saying that the, the top guys and girls just don't do what the average guy would do in a, in a box. And that's the contradiction of CrossFit training is that what they what they sell to the masses just isn't what the top guys do at all. Uh, but they do, they, they sell it, to, they sell it to them just to keep them in the box and keep them buying crap. Uh, what people but, don't understand is we had this conversation in the seventies. Yeah. It was circuit training. We've already had this conversation. Yeah. We already know the answer. You're just doing a different kind of circuit. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's just it's just very hard to get through to the, them though. I think um, I think part of it is the CrossFit sort of cult mentality. There's there's quite a lot of that. Uh, not to sort of deep dive into you know bollock and CrossFit here, but they're, they're just no, they're that. not bollock and CrossFit at all. Man, CrossFit yeah. great. People want to do it. Sweet. I have absolutely yeah. no issue with that. Yeah. It, and then it depends on someone who has come from a powerlifting background and into a bodybuilding background. You have a different mindset than someone who is just new to CrossFit. So it's a different, it's a different mindset. It's a different goal. These people come to there's 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 a lot of people that just come to CrossFit for a workout, and they're happy enough with that. And then the people who are not happy enough with that, who maybe have a mindset, who have more of a mastery mindset, they'll fall upon the patterns that we're talking about. They'll realize that oh wait, I need to look at my weightlifting. I maybe need a coach. Ah mm -hmm. uh, wait, I need to look at my gymnastics. I maybe need a coach. Oh wait, my my gas tank shit. I maybe need to look at some triathlon training. Yeah. Whereas the people who are, you, know, you see this, if, you see it as a personal trainer all the time, or if you train people all the time, you'll see people come in and out. So people come in at the, at the beginner stage because they're like, oh, this is cool workout. I'll try this. And then we inevitably, we have a churn of, of novices at Barbell Club. And then the people who like engage with it, then they, they become like part of the club and they become part of the club indefinitely. Whereas the churn, there's just like a revolving door of people who want to try something new. And then find out, oh wait, this shit's actually pretty boring. I'm gonna go try something else. Mm -hmm. But we're not trying. We're not trying to capture that market. Yeah, yeah we're definitely. trying to cap. We're trying. We're trying to look at the people like us who want to who want to get better at something, who want to achieve mastery of something. That's that's the people we want to work with. We don't want to work with people who just want to work out. Yeah, and I I actually think. Certainly gyms and I've seen some gyms in London and heard of some gyms in America who are kind of starting to move away from this one size fits all generic model of circuit training slash CrossFit and going into more individualized routines and programs. Uh, I know there's a gym near where I live where who's starting to offer that to their clients. Uh, I think that's, well, hopefully that's the way we're kind of moving towards more individualized conditioning routines, individualized strength routines uh, as part of that gym package. Well, it becomes a, it becomes a problem with scale though there. Yeah. You're actually, you're actually offering. It, it takes time. It takes effort to produce individualization. And as such, it comes at a premium. Yeah. So, and then, and then that becomes an issue for that business model. So, I mean, you can you can come to a compromise where we can say, right, we all want to be. So, for instance, we all want to be part of this. Well, we can produce a pretty good template for that over a year, which then we can apply which is individualized to the goal, it won't be individualized to the person, but it's individualized to the goal. So we can do that at scale. We can provide value at that. But then it, it just depends how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. And if you want to go down the rabbit hole, you're going to have to expend resources on getting down the rabbit hole the way it works. And then as a business model, that, that, that kind of that can only be as it is. Now, I'm never going to be a pure gym. I, can, I, I, I wouldn't want to be a pure gym, but I, I'm never going to have like 300 sites over the UK. I'm not going to be a multi-million pound. Business because why do doesn't doesn't scale like that? 
yeah that's true and i think it, it also responds to experience levels as well i think you can have that sort of group setting with a bunch of beginners because they're generally going to be doing a lot of the yeah, shit is going to work and that's kind of what we try to provide with yeah. our novice program is we come into sessions train in the sessions train to the program you like it move on to our core program you like that then you can keep on going on that individual definitely or actually i want to take this more seriously we provide individual services then you can kind of like come up our tier of offerings and of services and that way everyone kind of gets what they want and if you decide it's not for you no issues you can go try something else yeah that sounds great right so just um, shifting gears a little bit to uh, to the next question uh Thoughts on weak body parts. Uh, so my example, uh, I years ago I was talking to a PT and, and they were talking about weak triceps for the bench. It's all very west side. Like if you're weak, if you've got a weak um, sort of mid to lockout, you should be working your triceps. I completely disagree with that approach. I think it's fucking stupid. Uh, I think for the most part you're going to fail somewhere, and a lot of the time you just need to get better at the bench, particularly for guys who perhaps aren't even benching three plates aside. Um, what, what are your thoughts on weak body parts versus more variations or more of the same lift? So we need to understand what we're talking about. So when we talk about, so when we do any biomechanical movement, there's a sticking point in that biomechanical movement. So what a sticking point is, it's a leverage issue. So when I'm doing a deadlift, when I do a deadlift, my sticking point is below my knees. There is literally fuck all I can do to change that outside of go to sumo or to lob off, lob off part of my leg. I can't change that. You don't want to go to sumo, so. No. Well, <laughs> sorry. It hasn't worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so without, out with the changing the biomechanics of the lift, changing the technique of the lift, changing the lift, and even then we just change the sticking point. So for a sumo lifter, the sticking point's off the floor. So we, ha we have... We have a sticking point in, in, in human movement, in closed chain kinetic movement as a human, we have sticking points. So we can't change that. That's not, that's not going to change. So if, if uh, my sticking point on, on bench press is towards lockout, it's to do with my grip and how my insertions are, my limb length, it's not to do with my triceps being weak. It's to do with my ability to produce force through that movement. And there is a point where I produce the least amount of force. So that's so. Once we understand that that's reality, and we can't change reality, then how do I how do I overcome that? So from a bench press, we can become better at producing momentum from the bottom position. That momentum will carry us through sticking points. Speed's hugely important on bench press. Um, some some specialization around the joint angle does work. We can bring up strength. Strength is joint angle specific. So if I do pause work at my sticking point below above and at my sticking point i will become stronger at in that position in the lift because i'm working on my strength with the bar like so if i do a pause squat or a pause bench or a pause deadlift i can affect that sticking point i can make it stronger but it's still going to be where i fail so yes yes specialization in the program around sticking points is really important but saying that Triceps are weak, or quads are weak, or back is weak. It's just naive. Movement is incredibly complex. To to curl your bicep, so your your bicep has I don't know like millions, hundreds of millions of muscle fibers, hundreds of motor units. To curl, to do a, to do a simple unweighted curl, I have to silence the tricep. I have to co contract the bicep and the tricep. So that means my my tricep needs to switch off. My bicep needs to switch on. Depending on the pronation or the orientation of my wrist, that changes what 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 motor units of my bicep are getting fired, how they're getting fired, and when I start adding in force and speed, Golgi tens muscle spindles start getting involved to make sure that I'm not lengthening too fast, I'm not producing force too fast, so I don't rupture a bicep. Like human movement is obscenely complex. To say something like a weak tricep is why you fail on bench press just shows that you lack understanding of what you're actually doing and what you're trying to produce. So I personally don't like the language. There is, there, there, there is truth in it, but I really don't like the language. Yeah, I think it, it attempts to simplify an issue which shouldn't really be simplified because there's more to it than that. 
Yeah, it's, 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 you can simplify it to the fact of this is my goal. This is my this is my this is the blockage to my goal. So let's try and address that rather than trying to do shit like tricep tricep push downs for how the fuck's that going to help your match back? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I completely agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I've got another question. These are these are starting to be some questions which came in from Instagram. Um, so there's a question here on breathing and bracing guidance and tips. So either anything you can talk us through or, you know, videos or that you may have or you've seen. It's specific to the lift. I think some of the best stuff on this, Chris Duffin's done some stuff on squat, which is really good. Yeah, really good. Um, I, I love that video. Yeah, so he's got some, like, it's called, like, the like the worst cue for squat, but chest up. If you watch that, then you'll understand bracing from terms of, like, a practical standpoint. I've done videos on it as well, but I think I've done it as well as Chris, so. I think that's probably the best, the best video I've seen on the topic. But it basically, if you if if you look for anything on the va- Vasala maneuver, is that yeah, right? Vasala maneuver, Vasala maneuver mm. sounds like vinegar. <laughs> um, if if you search for that, then you'll understand more of the concept behind it. But yeah, breathing and embracing is something that you absolutely need to do. But it's 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 integral to the technique. Uh, it's it's basically once once I teach someone how to set up the rack for a squat say, once I teach someone how to set up the rack, where to put it on their back, how to stand up, how to walk it out, the next thing we talk about is how to brace. It's, it's just part of, it's part of executing the movement and it's, it is incredibly important for deadlift and squat, like incredibly important. Yeah, I was, it was highlighted to me from uh, Tom Martin, particularly from the deadlift. Uh, the breathing and bracing was more for him when he was talking to me about it, it was more to do with the positioning of the knees and how that affects the position of the chest. Uh, the, the common cue that you hear from a lot of coaches who don't really know how to train the deadlift is the stick your neck up, stick your neck up, stick your head up. But the reality is that if you are braced in a correct way with a neutral spine, you push those knees forward at the beginning of the movement, that should automatically raise your chest. Uh, the, the the chest up sort of cue actually comes from the knees for the most part because that sort of pushes the hips forward and realigns the rest of the body. So, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's vital to get that positioning right so you're able to the rest of it. It's all it's all it's all all the way through the chain. It, it works well. Well, if you just think of think of it mechanistically. So, the lever that's lifting the bar is your torso is your spine. So, would you want to if if I wanted to hurt you? Would I hit you with a steel rod or would I hit you with a rubber dildo? <laughs> I'd hit you with a steel rod because it's it will transfer the force that I put it into it. So your your torso is no different. It needs to be stiff if you want to transfer the force that your knees and your hips are capable of producing, put it in, into the barbell. You need to have a stiff torso for transference. And a stiff torso is a braced torso. Yeah. Uh, the, the example I always give is uh, when you're a kid in the playground and you used to play that game with your, your buddy and you'd punch each other in the stomach and you, you know you wouldn't suck your stomach in, you'd almost push your stomach out. And that yeah. was an example of bracing. Yeah, and another good point is would you would you lift your chest up or would you put your ribcage down? Right, exactly. You'd put your ribcage down. So when you brace, that's exactly what you do. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, right, really good. Um, so a little bit of talking about breathing and guidance there and also a video to watch uh, Christoph and Zach. I can link that in as well. Um, so we, another question from Instagram, uh, if a trainee wants to diet, so if they're looking to reduce their body weight while they're getting stronger, do you recommend anything, in, anything specific in terms of diet or training or mentality that like you reduce volume, etc.? So I don't really change the training to be honest. Um, the training remains the same, whether we're in calorie surplus or calorie deficit, what will change is your adaptation to the training. So if I'm, if I'm in a mild calorie surplus with an abundance of protein, I'm probably going to recover faster. And if I recover faster, I'm going to adapt quicker to the training load I'm under. So if we say, if we do something very simple, like we both do the same five by five workout and we're just trying to add weight to the bar, the person in calorie surplus with an abundance of protein and sleep, they will add more weight to the bar faster than someone who is in a mild calorie deficit you still have sufficient protein, but by nature will not have the same recovery as someone who is in a mild calorie surplus. So we just we just accept, accept that from as rope that we're just not we're not going to ex- we're still going to progress, but we're going to accept that our progress might not be as fast or as good as in a different scenario. So the, yeah, the, 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 sorry, are you going to say? 
Uh, no, I was just saying, I, I suppose you can also use the weights used as a gauge of how well it's going. So if the weights start to go actually down in a session, that probably means they died too hard, I guess. Yeah, so what, what, we, what, we, what we're looking to do is we're trying to affect change regularly, consistently, and slowly. So when we look at weight loss, I'm looking for a maximum of 500 grams a week from an average standpoint. So when we take, so we, we log body weight, we log calories, we log protein, and we log steps. And what we're looking for from that logging is we're looking at the average values and we're looking at trends. So like we look at you know, a moving average or you can look at a weekly average or you can look at a three-day average. Some way we're, we're not looking at acute fluctuations from day to day because that's mean, meaningless noise. Mm -hmm. We're trying to reduce the noise of the signal. And as such, we look at the moving average or you can look at a seven-day moving average, a 14-day moving average. You can, you can look at it however you want. But we're looking at an average, and that average should come down at about 250 to 500 grams per week, roughly, depending on the size of the person. If a bigger person might come down faster, smaller person comes down slower. But when that when that stalls, then we know we need to change some variables. But we try we try and produce the deficit through diet, yeah. or through maybe a, a raise in in daily activity. So we, so for example, if someone has an average step count of 6,000, we encourage them to go to 8,000, then we encourage them to go to 10,000. Before we, so we, we try and try and produce it through, through, so normally I will get someone to eat at maintenance, because often you'll find people, even putting someone on maintenance based off BMR calculation, then 1.4 times Harris Benedict equation, I think it's a pretty good starting point. You'll find for a lot of people, just by adhering to that tracking, They'll lose weight, and then once they're losing weight, we change fuck all. We just we encourage them to stay the same, to engage the training the same, engage the daily activity the same, and then once we get to a point where we're maybe stalling out, then we can look at we can reduce the intake, or we can increase the expenditure through steps, or we reduce the the intake through like two hundred calories less or 150 calories less but it's just the, the kind of the main as you as you'll no doubt know the main point is getting them to engage in the process once they're engaging in the process consistently where they're weighing themselves in they're recording their macros they're recording their calories even if they have a bad day they still record it once they're in that process then it's, it's easy it's easy it's just getting them into the process that's the difficult point but when we're when we are in the process we're looking to to reduce body fat and we're just looking to have a consistent calorie deficit yeah. and we can reduce that through activity we just have to be dietary manipulation we want our protein high so we want our protein at the higher end of what's suggested so 2.2 grams per kilo of body weight two grams per kilo of body weight that's sufficient we don't need any more than that and then yeah. and then we can look at so we can look at and then there's some individualization there so Someone might find on my energy. So, for instance, I'm working with a guy who we cut him from 114 to 105, and he was finding that his his, his energy and his workouts was dipping. So, what we did is we took we took we took calories from his rest days and put it into his training days. So he was in like an acute surplus on the training days, but he was in more of a deficit in his non-training days. That allowed him more carbohydrates around the workout. That allowed him to have better workouts. That allows him to have better progress and still lose the weight. So there's still like there's manipulations within that, but without having but there are people who are like oh I want to lose weight okay here's here's a tracking table fill it out they don't fill it out guess what happens they don't lose weight <laughs> yeah yeah it's actually a remarkably similar process to the majority of what I do aside from the sort of the latest few weeks of prep that, that's pretty much a very very similar process um, and it's interesting you talked about sort of uh, moving calories around around workouts that was actually the next question uh, to move on to the final question what what do you sort of recommend to your lifters in terms of pe what we might call peri workout nutrition? So you know, pre, intro, or after. So, so by its nature, um, strength training doesn't actually require any form of um, manipulation of diet. So if I look at something, so let's say we have a middle distance runner, you can run at eighty percent of the VO two max for 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, without accruing lactate. That person can train with sufficient intensity where they can burn glycogen as their primary source of fuel. 
So that person may require carbohydrate supplementation for their training. Someone who trains twice a day, they require carbo carbohydrate manipulation for the training. Someone who's lifting weights once a day, assuming that they have sufficient carbohydrate intake, assuming they have sufficient calorie intake, sufficient, uh, uh, assuming they have sufficient protein intake, su assuming su uh, sufficient sleep, they don't require any dietary manipulation to affect their performance. Things that will affect performance, pre-workouts, stimulants, things like that, hydration, Hydration and stimulants are probably the only two things that really actually make a material difference to someone who's lifting weights once a day. So if you have a pre-workout or you have like a strong coffee before your workout, so 30 minutes before your workout, if you have five, 400 to 600 milligrams of caffeine and then during your workout you're hydrated, you're good to go pretty much. Um, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say... Uh, so like where so like in an optimal environment we're gonna have our protein every three hours or every two to three hours so we're keeping net protein muscle protein synthesis elevated during the week during the day we can have protein shake mid sleep and that's gonna have a benefit but that needs to be applied consistently to have a benefit but that's that's an optimal environment to hit kind of the broad strokes as long as we're hitting our protein targets our calorie targets. Our carbohydrates are stupidly low. Our fat is stupidly low. And as long as it's appropriate to our goal, we're adhering to that. Then the only thing that's really going to add value to that is some kind of stimulant and then hydration. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And uh, it's quite ref it's refreshing to hear um, just how, uh, not simple per se, but just, just how um, sort of just you, you stick to a lot of the big rocks with with the majority of what you do and it's just something that struck me is since moving from powerlifting to bodybuilding bodybuilders are as a whole a lot more neurotic <laughs> why why do you think that why do you think that might be well it's kind of inherent isn't it i mean yeah. what drew me to powerlifting was the objectiveness of it i came came from a, I come from a rugby so i come from a team sport where there's subjectiveness in the coaches selection there's subjectiveness. There is objectiveness to you know. If I smash you, you get smashed. But there's there is there there is subjectiveness to it. So that's like when fights go to decision. It's always unsatisfying mm. because there's a subjective. Unless it's clear, but there's always it's not as, as satisfying as someone getting armbarred or someone getting knocked out or someone getting choked out. <laughs> that's satisfying. That that's a clear outcome. Yeah. That's why I really like about powerlifting was there's a, there's clear outcome and there is subjectiveness in powerlifting. They all say right depth and stuff, but that's why I like IPF. Yeah, it's it's strict, but as long yeah. as as long as it's as long as it's consistent, I'm very happy with it being strict. Yeah. Uh, the problem comes when there's when there's like there there's like there's variability to it. That's where we get problems. So if you look at bodybuilding, it's it's a beauty pageant and all but name and it's it's subjected to certain standards and there there are judges that enact that standard but it's it's all subjective there's there's no real objectivity to it so by its nature it produces that kind of like neurotic kind of feedback loop where yeah i think i look pretty good but do you think i look good like do you think this do you think that yeah so it, it, all, it almost begats that kind of mindset and then the, the sort of person that is drawn to it and um, I don't know like I don't really I was kind of drawn to it at the start but then when I when I discovered Parleton was a thing I was like nah fuck that I'm gonna do this um, because not that I don't like looking good but at the same token I don't, don't really give a shit like it, like nah I do I almost like give a shit to that point but I think I, 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 I prefer to like to lift heavy weights and you know I'm fat because it helps me lift heavy weights yeah, I, I was the same. I mean, what attracted me to immediately to powerlifting, I was completely immediately put off bodybuilding uh, right from the start was just the fact that I could I could be strong and I was lifting the weight category. Initially, it was the 82.5 back then when it was the, uh, when um, when it was on the baller. Um, and that, I just liked that. I didn't have to be super shredded or do the crazy diets, but I liked the fact that I could be strong and relatively lean. That, that kind of worked well. Yeah, so... Uh, just final sort of pop question for you. Um, predictions for the next Mr. Olympia. <laughs> That's probably Ronnie. I mean, he's, <laughs> I mean, I mean he, 
he, he, he's had some problems with his legs recently. <laughs> he's he's he, going to be back. He, he's going to get his leg development sorted. I mean, I know I know Jay's bringing a pretty good package next year, but <laughs> I, I think Ronnie can. To be honest, I, I've I've totally fallen off bodybuilding, and I, I was never really like R- Ronnie's like my R- Ronnie's literally a god to me. Like Ronnie <laughs> keeps me wrong. I, yeah. I I've watched the the unbelievable DVD literally over a hundred times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ronnie Arnold, th- those guys are like two of my biggest heroes, and obviously they're both massive bodybuilders. Yeah. And um, but bodybuild, so I just think it lacks the personalities. Like just from someone from like a casual fan, yeah. it kind of lacks the personalities. Like Phil Heath does nothing for me. Kai yeah, Green no, does yeah. nothing for me. Yeah, he doesn't. I don't. I'm not a big fan of all the Kai Green nonsense. But uh, I I really liked a big rant. You came. I don't know if you remember doing this, but you made a big rant about Ronnie Coleman because uh, everyone was sort of going on at him about how he should have trained differently. Oh, that, that fuck! I hate that shit, man. Yeah, that I agree. I, I agree with you totally. Bullshit. Yeah. Look at what that guy's done. I was literally, so I was sitting down, um, I was meant to do a morning workout, and I sat down, and I couldn't be fucked. I got up, put on that recent Ronnie Coleman DVD, and I see Ronnie Coleman in crutches, yeah. like fucking going to the gym, working yeah. out, like having business. The guy's running like a multi-million pound supplement company. Yeah. He can't fucking walk, barely. Yeah, and he, he doesn't, he's, never he's, says a bad word about anybody. Surgeries, doing that. Yeah. He just does him, and he's just a positive guy. Yeah. And just watching that, I was like, God damn it, right, I'm going to the gym. Uh, I literally stopped the documentary halfway through. It's like, fuck's sake, I've got to go. This guy's like, it was the moment that kind of broke me was he was like sitting in his car, driving to the gym, taking a business call in his Bentley. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> I suppose I better go do my slow work. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, love, I love what you had to say, because he, he never says a bad word about anybody. He's always got nah. to talk to his fans. He just does, and- does his shit. He does, and, to like, shit on a guy like that, I think is unreasonable. Why would you shit on a guy like that? A guy who's been fucking eight-time Mr. Olympia. Yeah. A guy who has multi-million pound business. A guy who's achieved more in one lifetime than you'll ever achieve in ten lifetimes. Yeah. In his own chosen field. Like, the reason the reason he is in a, like potentially in a wheelchair, the reason he's hobbling around, is because he has that mindset that drove him there. And, like, if he lived out the, his, his lifetime, like, a million times, he'd do the same shit every time. Yeah. Like I respect the shit out of that. Like I, I respect bodybuilding when it's like extreme. I respect the shit out of bodybuilding when it's extreme. When you're when you're trying to get as big as possible, as big and as shredded as possible, and you're willing to take years off your life taking fucking grams and grams of tests to get to that point, I respect the shit out of that. Yeah. Because it's someone with a goal and they're willing to do whatever it takes to, to reach that goal. And that I can respect. Yeah, and yeah. It, if you if you're not done with that, you can go fuck yourself. Like, <laughs> love it, love it, fantastic. Um, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll end with um, the Ripito poem. How's that? <laughs> Since we start yeah, with the Roddy prayer, so this is. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to write, you can set me off on a mark. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is the one that my brother wrote a few years ago. This is footprints in the chalk dust. Uh, one night I dreamed I was squatting in the gym with Ripito. Many scenes from my life flashed across the walls. In each scene, I noticed footprints in the chalk dust. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints, other times there were one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the, the deepest portions of the squat, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to Ripito, you promised me, coach, that if I followed you, you'd make me strong always. But I noticed that during the deepest part of my squat, there have only been one set of prints in a chalk. Why? When I needed you the most, you didn't spot me. And Ripito replied, the times when you've only seen one set of footprints is when I squatted you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, call it. Yeah. Hey, boy, why are you looking up in that squat? You gotta look down. You yeah, want to transfer in that squat? You gotta look down. Look down but you want to squat in? What you want to do right now is you want to <laughs> squat into the palm of my hand. You feel my, you feel my hand to lower your back. That's right there, the small of your back. Okay, feel that? What you got to do right now is you got to push up into that hand at the bottom of the squat. And you got to use the hips. You got to use the hips. Now, one, two, come up out of the bottom of that squat. Give it a hip drive. Hip drive. Now you get, you start to get it now. Look down. Hip drive. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> that, is, that, that describes him well. I mean, we're just missing the uh, the machetes, you know, that he used to yeah. make your videos. That was fucking weird. Pistols as well. He's kind of got to do that. That was fucking weird. Yeah, that was great. 
Fantastic. Right. Um, brilliant. Thanks for that, Mark. Really, really enjoyed that. And, no worries, man. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. And uh, thanks for the great answers. I'll put all your contact details and stuff in the um, wherever I post this. So for now, thanks, Mark. And cool. Cheers, guys. Cheers, mate.